Spanish and in English. If you did not get one, they will be up here on the edge of the pulpit. Feel free to come and get one. Uh, I know it's been cold, flu-like weather. We're so glad you are here today. Uh, I'm glad to see my friends Joe and Joanne Shelton able to get out today. We love them. And Sana and Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you ready? That's our little joke there. I'm not picking on her. Dorothy, good to see you in the back. I'm, I'm looking around. Kim, always good to see you. Matthew, good to see you. I, I could name some more. We're glad everyone is here today. Uh, you're not here by accident. And God knew who would be here. God knew you would be here before you ever knew you were going to be here today. Brittany, good to see you today. I'm, I'm just kind of getting my bearings here for just a second. It's been an awkward day. We've, we've had heater problems. We've had key people out sick, people that don't normally need a ride, need a ride, Sunday school placement. It's just been a day, but I think the Lord also knew what we were going to face today before we got here. Um, look in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, and I'm going to read just a few verses, and then we're going to pray, uh, lest I forget it. Um, please remember next Saturday at 5 our good friend, Brother Tim Milligan from Cookville, who is a tremendous prayer intercessory person, is going to be coming leading us in a workshop of prayer. And then following that, we're going to have a season of prayer for our church and our city. And uh, if you can, at all possible, if we call this your church home, please be here for that. Also, there will be more information coming to anybody who wants to be a part of our leadership. I almost said retreat, but let's call it advancement. I'm not going backwards. I want to go forwards, don't you? Amen. Deuteronomy. Oh, I almost forgot. Sister Tomasa had a birthday. Happy birthday to you. A happy birthday to you. May you feel Jesus near every day of the year. A happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. And the best year you've ever had. Man, I could sing Feliz Navidad right there. Mm. Just kidding, sis. We appreciate you. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Look at verse 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land whether you go to, everybody say, possess it. <clears throat> that thou mightst fear the Lord thy God and keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou, and thy, everybody say, thy sons, and thy sons' sons, and all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe, everybody say, to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that thy they may increase mightily, and the Lord God of your fathers has promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Mm. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Now, here, here we go. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. I feel the Holy Ghost. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as front lips between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and upon thy gates. Today we are starting our month-long month focus on family in focus. Family matters. And I want to, I'm trying, not, trying hard not to teach what I've got for the whole month in one lesson because my heart is full. But today I want to ask a very simple question why the family? Why the family? And before we pray today, 
if at all possible, I would like every family to find your way. I want families to sit with your family today. Go ahead, take a minute. If you're not sitting with your family because you can't get along, because they're robbing your joy today, come on. Everybody find your family. Y'all good? Looks like most of y'all get along. While you're looking, please remember Sister Diane Dismuke. She is in the hospital. She had a fall this week, has a broken hip. Please pray for her. Brother Jeff is here by himself, but he's not sitting by himself. He's part of this big old family, isn't he? We love Brother Jeff. Please pray for him. Amen. Amen. Now, you got your families together? I want you to, if you're in your family, I want you to hold hands right now. We're going to pray Jesus today. God, knit us together one by one, family upon family. God, let our heart and purpose be to find your will for living. God, at the end, we may be obedient. God, that we may be an example of what you're wanting to do through the family, we pray. Then let the church say amen. Amen. You may be seated today. As a pastor, I am not perfect. You talk to some pastor leaders and they say, I wouldn't change a thing. There's more than one thing I would do different and do better than I've done thus far. But as a pastor, my greatest accomplishment thus far from my perspective is that my family is in the house of the Lord, serving the Lord. And here's a very important part, serving the Lord with gladness. There's a difference between just showing up and serving the Lord with gladness. And so I tell you today, my only credentials that gives me credibility in this area, besides 30 years of marriage, 30 years of ministry, and 30 years of being a father, is that I take my job very seriously, my job. Today we understand from scriptures, now I know these lessons are not going to be comfortable for everybody. Some of you have had some very difficult home lives. Others of you are in the midst of a strange situations, hurt feelings, raw emotions. Some of you have been separated by the grave from family. And I understand that. But that does not mean that we should not look at what the scriptures have to say about making the most of the family God has given us. Everybody say amen. Okay, right there. Now, just to be honest for a moment, uh, I ask myself the very simple question, why family? Why did God choose to use the family? We know from Scripture that God looked at man that he created for relationship, and he says, my desire is to have a relationship with man, but man is incomplete. He is inadequate in himself. Now, we can make a joke out of that, that there's no man that is a whole man without a woman. man. God created man with something missing that required him to create a woman. <clears throat> now, you can think what you want to think or say it the way you want to say it. I believe that God so loved the relationship with Adam, the one man, that he said, I need to create a woe man that there could be more of mankind. I want more of them, not less of them. Let me ask you a question. Would you prefer to have one gift at Christmas or a hundred gifts at Christmas? If you were sick, would you want one text message to see how you are or 100 text messages to see how you And God said, oh, if a little bit's good, a whole lot more is a whole lot better. So he created woman that there could be more mankind. Now, Man was incomplete, so he created woman. But it wasn't long after woman came on the scene that woman realized she needed man to keep her out of the apple tree. And God made part of her punishment that she became subordinate to man. I know that is not popular teaching. And you're saying, I'm a woman and I am not married. I am telling you the scriptures declare that God would desire if there's going to be children to operate within an intact family. Let me give you one amen on that. Okay, single moms, is it better, easier by yourself? 
single dads, is it better, easier by yourself? You got my answer. Here we go. Webster's Dictionary says that family, by definition, is the basic unit of society, consisting of two parents, male and female, primarily for the rearing of children. It also can be a group of individuals living under one roof, usually under one headship, that have a common ancestry. I don't know about you, I have been to some family reunions. Those are interesting times. No one wants to go to the family reunion to see the one cousin that sheriff's deputies had to escort them there. Anybody says me got family? You cry at their funeral, but you don't want to go on vacation with them. Let me also say this to us today, that we say we don't care. Many adults struggle to adjust being adults because of failed relationships with family. It does affect who we are and who we become. Now, saying that it was God's desire to have more humanity, God chose the family as the fundamental building block of society. Does that, we got a lot of talking, is it just me? Okay. Now, anybody here ever played with kids' toys? Any adults ever played with kids? That's half the fun of buying your kids' presents for Christmas, is getting to play with their... I remember when low, uh, Legos came on the scene. You know what Legos are good for? I think they throw handfuls of them in the sand in Afghanistan, and that's what those Taliban step on. Woo! They surrender. Nothing hurts like stepping on a Lego, does it, barefooted? Nothing. And Jill and I have nephews that they're grown now, but when they're kids, they obsess, Sister Vicky, on Legos. And they say, oh, Uncle Carlos, we're going to build a castle. We're going to build a jet engine. We're going to build a rocket. And I said, let's go see it. And I go to there, and it'd be buckets and buckets of Legos. In their mind, they could already envision the finished product. The Bible says without a vision, the people perish. You've got to visualize where you're going. But you cannot ignore the individual components that it takes coming together to make the greater Accomplishment. Does that make sense? God chose as the fundamental building block to build the kingdom. Each individual Lego, God chose a family. Let me ask a question. Is there a Lego with just one little top part? They make one. Well, they've advanced Lego since I was up here. Is that connection more solid than one that has six of those little things? No. Well, that'll preach. God chose mom, dad, and through their relationship, the byproduct would be children, and their function is to raise the children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna teach or preach very long, but I'm gonna say this today. I am uncomfortable with modern parenting. That it started about twenty five years ago. Well, I don't want to make my kids be religious, I want them to have the room and the freedom to choose. I'm going to raise them spiritually neutral. And I don't want them to be Pentecostal because I'm Pentecostal. If they choose to be other denominations or no denomination, that's okay. You made a fatal mistake because our enemy, the devil, is not playing neutral with your children that through through. Other society, they are trying to indoctrinate your children to humanism, worldliness, atheism. They're, they're, they're not playing fair. Okay. Now, another point, do you see the progression, how we've gone from, well, I, don't, I want them to be spiritually neutral and they can decide their path. Now, have you seen recently parents want to raise their children gender neutral I don't want society to predetermine that they're male or female I want them to grow up and decide what they are 
I think that was decided when they were born. Do you know what is happening when parents fail to affirm their children to be who they are? They grow up not knowing who they are. We're talking about kids. Primarily right now we're seeing the manifestation in New York and California. When you get a lot of people together, it don't take them long to get stupid. Humanism. You get a lot of humans together. What happened to the Tower of Babel? The, the majority of people were concentrated in one area, and they said, we don't need God. We can bypass him. How'd that work out? Big cities like New York, L.A., that's where we're seeing the majority. Of, we want to keep our children gender neutral. And these kids are now in 7th, 8th, not 10th grade, and they are confused whether they're male or female because nobody's come along and said, son, you're a boy. And this is what boys do. Boys become men. And men bear responsibility. Men demonstrate that they have character and integrity. Y'all are not with me. The Bible says, speaking primarily to the male sect, he who does not provide for his own family is worse than an unbeliever. Do you understand that in the vacuum of the absence of God in the home, we now have a generation that is fatherless? It is a shame, my African-American family, that... 83% of young men never have a father in the home. It breaks my heart. God said, I'm going to pick the unit known as the family, mom, dad, and they're going to have kids. And we get excited about Deuteronomy chapter 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. But he goes on to say that, Mom and Dad, it is your job. You don't let them grow up and think, I want to marry a tree. You don't let them grow up and think I'm gender neutral. You don't let them grow up thinking there is many gods. You better teach them at your supper table. When you go to Walmart, when you come back home, it better be like a placard sitting in front of your eyes that when you lay down at night, when you scramble the egg, as you live life, you are to demonstrate there is a God, his purpose, and our purpose is to serve him. God said, I got Adam. I like my relationship with Adam, so I'm going to give him an Eve. And out of Adam and Eve, there's going to be a lot more people, and I don't want them to grow up and not serve me. I've created the family that there can be more family, there can be more people who love me and serve me and appreciate me. I'm just going to let my kids coast. I'm afraid we get home and entertainment is our God, and we're letting the world raise our children. Ain't nobody shouting. Ain't nobody shouting. I mentioned African-American culture. Let me talk about white Anglo-Saxon culture. That it is less than 33% of all of our children will grow up with the original mom and dad in the home. And we wonder why our kids are so messed up. How am I doing? How am I doing? We're focusing on the family. Let me tell you what. Pastor has got you or got your kids about two or three hours a week. Let me tell you what. God called a father. You know what the family does? Mom and dad, they set the boundaries in the home. I heard my dad more than once when I thought I was grown. Say, son, you can do what you want to, but you ain't going to do it in this house. As moms and dads... Pastors say we get what we preach. That is a lie. We don't get what we preach. We get what we tolerate. As a father of this church, I stand under the unction, the anointing, with the responsibility. I cannot tell you sin is righteousness. And you as a mom and dad, you set the tone in your home. If you're letting your kids wear things they ought not wear, if you're letting your kids go places they ought not go, you're letting your kids participate in things they ought not participate in, it's no big deal. It's a big deal. You're the gatekeeper. It's not my job. I can't undo in two or three hours what you're doing in 165 hours a week. You better not let the school teacher and the Boy Scouts and the soccer coach raise your kid, you better take the admonition of the Lord. Your responsibility is to raise them. Not grow up wild, get it if they get it.
catch it if they can. No, it's my job. Come here. Come here, Brian. No, no, better. Emery, come here. You like that high bun? What Poppy and Gigi buy you this week? Uh-uh. Yes, you do. It came in the mail. A baton? A baton. Julie came down to the bedroom. I was sitting in my recliner, and she said, Emery's going through the house acting like she's. I said, well, man, we got Amazon on our phone. Why don't you order that baby a baton? Julie came back and says, well, it's $13. I said, no big deal. <laughs> Get it here. And it came in the mail. And Brother Charles, I got home the other day, and I said, Emery, did you get your baton? I already knew she did. She says, wait right here. Right there, right there. No, I'm not done with you. I'm not done with you. Stand right here. Act like you're, act like, act like you're going to hit the baseball. What do you use, a bat? Okay. St- no, stand there. Don't swing yet. Don't swing yet. Now, do you think Poppy is going to throw her a hard, high fastball? What's Poppy going to do? <laughs> I say, get ready. Here it comes. Are you ready? And I lob it as soft as I can. And I, I put enough light spin that it elevates. It gives her plenty of time to process and get ready. And what she swing. Oh, that was awesome. But if she misses, do I say, you stupid little kid? Would I say that? N- no, I wouldn't say that. What am I going to do? I'm going to stand right there and I'll run over here and I'll retrieve the ball. I said, it's good. You try it. You did okay. Come here. Let's do it. Do I say, she can't hit the ball. You might as well play something else. You ain't going to be good. Is that what I do? I said, now choke up on the bat. Choke up on the bat. Come on. Get. No, no. <clears throat> Turn this way. Okay. Get your arms there like you got the bat. Get your arms there. Now get, hold it real tight. Now look here. Watch me. Watch me. And here comes the ball. What are you going to do when I? Oh, she hit it. Yes. And I could have caught it. Oh, Poppy fell down and dropped the ball. You're safe. Go, girl, go. You're awesome. Go sit down. What are you talking about today? I don't want to go to church. <laughs> it ain't no fun. Well, you ain't seen pastors sit on the steps and cry before. That's a lot of fun, isn't it? When you say, I know you don't really care for it, baby. You can stay home. What are you doing? You're raising them spiritually neutral. You're losing them. Do you know why? You know why you're losing them? Because they're going to go to school tomorrow, and they're not going to be neutral. They're going to hang out with the kids on your street. Them kids are not spiritually neutral. You better get them up on Sunday morning and fill them full of hot wheat. <laughs> what is that called? Treated wheat. Malta meal. Oatmeal with honey and raisins and brown sugar. Come on, somebody. Okay, pancakes and bacon. Uh, I knew I'd get you. We make our job before a holy God a lot of things. I don't have Bible for a testimony service. I don't have Bible for a bread chart. I don't have Bible for a worship team, per se. I don't have Bible for a lot of things we do. But you raising your kids and the nurture and admonition... uh, you having family altar time, you having family prayer time, when you lay your kids down at night, you tell them how good God was today. When they get up tomorrow, you remind them that God woke you up. God started you on your way. God's going to provide for you. When I go into Walmart and the Salvation Army is ringing a bell, you may not give a lot of money, but you give and you show them that you're a giver because there's people that have got it worse off than you do. Thanks be the name of the Lord. I may not have everything I want, son or daughter, but God has blessed us. We have a roof over our head. We have clean water to drink. If you're not excited about it, they're not going to be excited about it. My dad, the master manipulator. Do you know how you are a master manipulator when your kids think it was a good idea? And they don't even realize they're being manipulated. My dad was the only dad in the world that could get you excited about cleaning the garage. If your kids and grandkids are not excited about coming to the house of the Lord, maybe you're not exhibiting the right amount of excitement about the house of the Lord. 
I don't got to go to church. I get to go to church. I don't have to sit in the worship service. I get to sit in the worship service. I don't have to lift my hands. I get to lift my hands. I don't have to give in tithes and offerings. I get to give in tithes and offerings. You're never more spiritual than when you're raising your kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, some of you saying, oh, I've got grown kids. You can't make them do nothing. I know. You can't, might not can make them do something, but you can make them wish they had done something. Give away their parking place. Change the locks on the door. Start charging them rent. Well, your rent's going to be $900 a month, but if you go to church with me, You think the devil plays fair? Now, let me say this. Parents, we get what we tolerate. Your children need to know it's not an option to go to the house of the Lord. It's not an option to serve him with gladness. I wish I had more amens on that. It's not an option to lift your hands. It's not an option to worship. It's not an option to give. Let's go back to the family unit for a minute. Do you realize that Joshua was the servant of Moses and because of his obedience and faithfulness serving under Moses that God made him the second generation leader of the nation of Israel? Did you realize that? And the people started doing what they wanted to do. Joshua boiled it down to the simplest part of society. Can you make everybody on your street go to church? Can you make everybody at your work go to church and serve God with gladness? No. Sometimes you can't even make yourself. I'm looking on this side here. You know who you are. Here it is. Joshua says, I'm the leader of Israel. I'm the closest connection to God before the people of Israel. You know what he said? You can do what you want to. But as far as me, y'all not shouting. You go back and do the genealogy, and you'll realize that Joshua's kids were in their 30s. He said, as far as me, that word house can mean family, the generations under me. You going to church, or are you going to wish you had? You got one job. You got one job. We love Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Here is Lord, I got one. But he goes on to say, but I have empowered you to be the people of the name that you would teach your children and demonstrate it through your families. I don't know if you know this or not, it just takes one cancer cell to destroy the whole body. One cancer cell. One cancer cell. It just takes one bad employee to ruin the whole workplace. It just takes one person in the church with a bad spirit. Y'all not shouting. You better take inventory of what's coming in and going out of your house. That is the smallest cell building block of the kingdom and of society. And you hear me, strong churches don't make strong families. Strong families make strong churches. We're taking a month to talk about the responsibility, and I'm trying to lay out for you what our job is. Who wants to know your job description? If you have your Bibles, flip with us. Julie, if you'll just go to Ephesians 6 and 1 for me, and instead of me looking it up, I'll just read what you got. I got four minutes. Who thinks I can do it in four minutes? <laughs> you deceive yourself. Six and one. Ephesians. Six and one. Going once. I'm sorry, it's not on the back wall. Oh, you've got the slide over. I kept waiting for the slide to change. I'm so sorry. She's smarter than I am. Children. Yes, amen. I've been praying for you. You want me to continue? Okay. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Some of you don't have godly parents. You're now grown. You better find you some godly. We all need spiritual moms and dads to encourage and direct our paths, to motivate us. Let me say this. I had been to Julie's house. We were dating. It was her mother's birthday. Julie had asked me to pick up a cookie. Remember the birthday cookies, the cookie company? Oh, those are so good. Oh, hallelujah. And I had gotten the birthday cookie, and we're trying to surprise Julie's mother for her birthday. And I put my car in park, but I didn't put the emergency brake on, and her parents lived on the hill. I came out, we're going to take her to dinner, and my car wasn't there, Brother Taylor. And then I saw smoke billowing up from the bottom of the hill. And my car 
had rolled down most of their driveway, and thankfully the, the rear quarter panel caught the hackberry tree next to the driveway. Har hackberries are hardwood. You didn't know how I knew that, but now you know how I know that. Now, I, I'm not usually thankful for an accident, but if it hadn't caught that tree, it went across the street and went through somebody's roof on the other side of the street going down the hill. Thank you for the hackberry tree, Lord. And so we went ahead and celebrated Julius Miller's birthday. I came home before midnight, because that was the rule. Only people after midnight burglars and bad women. Boundaries. That's what families are good for, setting boundaries. It's, some of you want to go to a really big church where you can slide in, slide out, and nobody notice. That's why we're a church family. When you come up missing, we come looking for you. Until you get a restraining order against us, we're going to come looking for you. Because you're not a part of a cult or a coliseum. You're a part of the family of God. And so I had to be home before midnight, and Dad went down the hall and checked our rooms. He went to bed at 8.30. But he got up about 11.50. But make sure we come home. So I'd come home. He knew I was home. The next morning, at 7.30 in the morning, I'm up on the couch on Sunday morning, Sister Vicki. I'm on the couch. Dad comes out. He, he'd put his uh, house coat on. He had his slippers on. And he was going to get the Sunday morning paper. Hey, son, what you doing up so early? Oh, nothing. Brother Robert, I'd parked my car around the, the, the crunched up side. I parked it beside the house where the crunched up side was on the neighbor's, facing the neighbor's house. I'll have to tell him, I don't have to tell him today. Why do today what you can put off till tomorrow? I think I'm helping some people. If I was just renting a room somewhere that it said, oh, Carlos is up early this morning. My dad oh, says, oh, nothing. I could tell it didn't just jive with his spirit. He went, hmm, somebody right here. But the tailor, he went out there and got that newspaper, and he walked all the way. I'm helping some people here. He walked all the I mean, he had to go through the mud. He walked there, and I could see him in that house coat going, Oh, my Lord. He came in the house, stood in the doorway with the paper in his arm. He said, I knew something was up. What happened to your car? And I told him. He said, well, is it still drivable? I said, yeah. He said, well, I won't ever have to tell you not to do that again. You be driving that crunched up car around town. You, I don't have to tell you. What did he tell me right there? I ain't helping you. Now, what's my point? Because something about moms and dads, they can just look at their kid. They know, they know just by the way they answer the inflections in their voice or, or the vocabulary or just their color. Something ain't right. Pastor may pass by you and not realize, but mom and dad said, I know something is wrong. That's why some of you moms and dads need to keep interceding for your children. What pastor don't see, God will use you to intercede. I'm telling you, if God, if God doesn't keep his hand on the family and the enemy comes in and destroys the family, do you realize that 88% of young men decide to become homosexual? It's because they've never had a father in their life. I was born that way. No, you were born in the image of God. But through the absence of the nucleus of the family, you've become something God. Y'all are not with. I'm telling you today, God has chosen the family. And the reason why is there's a connection. There's an accountability. There... I'm going to talk in a few more weeks about the difference between moms and dads. But Julie and I have had words before. I'm okay? It happens once or maybe. She said maybe. If I'm not here tonight, you'll know why. I couldn't put enough pancake makeup. It's a joke. Let me tell you, she's not wrong. I'm not wrong. Because God gives babies to parents. Dad's job is to motivate, inspire, and discipline, and hold accountable. Mom's job is to love, nurture, and encourage at all times. Sometimes she just wants to scoop them up and say, baby, it's okay. Sometimes what they need is a boot. 
All love and no discipline is a bratty child. I'm going to shout on that. None of us get excited about spanking the four-year-old, but the four-year-old that's never been spanked, nobody wants to be around them. And you take children raised in an absentee father home, there's something missing. Because God established the dad for these things and the mom for these things. Wives, if you're hamstringing your husband from doing his job, you better get your mind on your own garden. You, I'm not talking about being abusive, but I am talking about it takes love, it takes nurture, it takes encouragement, but it also takes a vision and accountability and discipline. And when mom and dad can get on the same page and work together with their different gifts, y'all not shouting. I'm seeing messed up kids because we got messed up parents. We got messed up families because we've gotten away from what God intended the family. You're not there to give them elaborate birthday parties and extravagant Christmases. If you can do that, I'm glad for you. But the best thing you can give your kids is the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Joshua says, even though I'm over Israel, I can't make Israel do nothing but for my house, my family, my kids. I wish more pastors would spend time with their kids. I'm tired of spending time with pastor friends and all their children are backslid. If you gain the whole world and lose your own family, what have you accomplished? Because I believe the church can get better and better. If you struggled getting out of the world, but then you raise your children to nurture the admonition of the Lord, and they got your testimony. I'm glad we're running 250, 275, whatever. I'm also glad there's a generation that's smarter and better than I am that hadn't made the mistakes I've made that's limit what God can do. You start coming out of the world and raising your family and the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Guess what the Word says in Deuteronomy 6? It says, don't be surprised that they become a blessed people and they prosper. I expect the next generation to be better than this generation. I'm going to be disappointed if some of you that have come up under me don't do better than I've done. Okay, let me boil it down. What parent doesn't want their kids to have it better than they did? How about some of our Latino families? You came here, why? Because you wanted to see Madonna? I don't think so. You want to watch the Titans? I don't think so. Steelers? Yeah. Amen. I thought I'd get an amen on that. Here, I, I'm, I'm closing. I'm, hear me, hear me. Some of our families that came from other countries, I believe if I pressed you a high percentage of why you risked everything to come here, is to have a better life for your children. Some of you left other states to come to this state to have a better opportunity for your family. Some of you come out of L.A. Some of you come out of big New York cities. And you say, man, i got to get my kids out of this. i got to get them in a place where they have hope and a future. Let me tell you what, you know where they have the greatest hope and the greatest future? is at the foot of the cross. Yeah. Quit telling your kids to go pray and go to the altar. Why don't you take them by the hand and take them to the altar? I hope I don't come off as mean today. Sister Elizabeth's going to play something. That's not my intent. But God has given us the family to provide support and security. God has given us the family to provide love and understanding. God has given us the family to bring protection from external influences. God has given us the family to let them have a center to the universe. Home. When I get disoriented, when I lose my way, if I can just get home. Mama's going to have supper cooked and daddy's going to run down and meet me at the... I'm telling somebody today, God has given us the family to help us raise children. God has given us the family to aid us in making decisions. God has given us the family to help us know who we are. I want you to stand today. Well, preacher, you went seven minutes over the normal time. The first thing you need to understand about a Pentecostal church, there is no such thing as normal. 
I had been praying about something for the first Sunday in February. We're going to come in and have church unplugged. You mean you can plan to be unplanned? Yes. We're going to come here the first Sunday in February, and we're going to come in here with reckless abandon, with no agenda except entertaining the presence of the Lord. But today, we're focusing on family. Sister Elizabeth's going to play something slow right now. I'm going to ask you this. Would you gather your family? I know this front can't contain everybody, but the greatest gift you can give your family today is the demonstration of obedience to God. Well, I don't have a lot of family. you got church family. Some of you are couples here by yourself. It's okay. Today, I want, as Elizabeth plays, if you have to turn around at the seat where you're at, if you come across this front, if you can work these aisles, you can work the back of it, wherever you want to go today. We're not going to leave this place till we accept the why of family. The why is that we would know and obey the will of God. Amen? Come on, once you find yourself a place to pray, commit yourself to the values of Scripture that we're going to be a family that God can use. We're going to be a family that's committed to the ways of the Lord. We as a family are going to worship and pray. We as a family are going to give. We're going to fast. We're going to worship the Lord with gladness today.